Assalamualaikum and Hakim from Indonesia. Uh, I'm not supposed to open this email because this meeting is broken. Uh, but yes, I'd like to take this opportunity to convey a message from uh, the president of Southeast Asia Astronomy Network. So for most of you, you should know that CIA link very closely to CI. Uh, for many, CIA is the child of CI, if you agree. So, so I'm not supposed to write my birthday there in the bio data because I'm not I'm too old for CIA. But anyway, uh, let me convey to you the message from the president of CI, Professor Jun Raksar. Yesterday he called me and he sent his best regard to all of you. They are very unfortunate that he could not come. But he'd like to assure you that on the next month we're going to have the, the, the fifth CIA meeting in in Kuala in Lumpur actually. In Bandi near Kuala Lumpur. Okay, so it is my pleasure to welcome all young astronomers to the second Southeast Asia Young Astronomers Collaboration Meeting, which is held in Bandung, Indonesia, uh, during the 19th to 23rd of November 2013. I hope this meeting will bring young astronomers together to present progress report on interesting results from their research work and the development of astronomy from their countries. I strongly believe that the CIA meeting would be a powerful mechanism to drive interaction and collaboration among young astronomers in Southeast Asia countries. I am happy to see the growth of both in quantity and quality of the young astronomers in this region. With the close collaboration among yourself continuously, I believe that astronomy in Southeast Asia will definitely be strengthened and accepted worldwide in the near future. I will do my best to support this meeting and all of you continuously. So I would like to thank actually the NOC for hosting this second CIA meeting as well as SOC of course and wish my best for success of all of you. Runaksar Sontantum, President of CIA. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, for the opening uh, remark from Professor Gunaksa. Uh, next, we will have the same introduction by our chair, uh, Rahel Sese. He can give you the close and personal about our CIA. <coughs> Hey, uh, good morning everyone. It's, a, it's my pleasure to welcome everyone here in Bandung, Indonesia for the second CIAP meeting. Uh, well, I'm, some of you I've met already, some of you uh, it's the first time I've seen you here, but I'm very happy that you were able to arrive safely here despite all the delays and everything, the flights, and I hope you're very well, uh, well rested for uh, and prepared for the next uh, four days. We have four days now. Uh, meeting here in uh, Bandung. So for today, I'll just give you a brief introduction of what is CIAP is. Uh, some of you might be familiar with it already since uh, you are very well involved with CIAP. Okay. Okay. So, so again, my name is Jeremy says I'm from the Philippines and I'm currently the chairman of the Southeast Asian Young Astronomers Collaboration or CIAP. Okay, so what is actually our motivation when we started CIAP way back in uh, sometime in 2008? Well, one of the things that we saw as uh, young astronomers is that uh, astronomy here is a relatively new field in Southeast Asia, and it's not as well established compared to other parts of Asia, such as Japan, Korea, China, uh, Eastern, uh, even India, okay? Eastern Asia and India. And we have very few senior and very few uh, junior astronomers, and in most cases, here in Southeast Asia, it's not a priority field of science. When we started thinking about SIA way back then, uh, one thing that we realized is that for, in order for astronomy to grow within the region, it is very, uh, it's important that there, should, uh, there has to be collaboration and cooperation between the different uh, members, uh, CIA members here in Southeast Asia. So SIA actually stands for the Southeast Asian Young Astronomers Collaboration. So this is a network of junior and uh, network of junior astronomers that are currently based or coming from South any Southeast Asian country. So we know we have what we call the ASEAN, uh, ASEAN countries. So we have more or less around ten countries here, which we enjoy a lot of benefit, uh, which I'll show you later. So when we say young junior astronomers or young astronomers, 
essentially these are from uh, students, undergraduate, graduate students, and even early postdocs uh, who are involved in astronomy research or astronomy education. Now, why do we have to do SIAC here in Southeast Asia? Well, there are certain advantages in doing collaborations within the Southeast Asian region. Uh, there are uh, four. First, we have the geographical similarity and proximity. So all the countries of the South uh, ASEAN, all the ASEAN countries, are within three to four hours of flight time. It's very close, unless you have a very long flight delay, which occasionally happens. Okay? In terms of economic situation, more uh, except for a few countries like Singapore, most Southeast Asian countries have uh, the same, more or less the same uh, economic status. So we know the problems that each country is, is experiencing, and we can relate to each other's economic, uh, economic problems. So this makes it very easy for us to set something like, for example, in the registration fee that we have today, uh, exactly the same as the registration fee that we had last year in the uh, Philippines. We also have a lot of cultural similarities. So countries like Malaysia, Singapore, uh, Malaysia, Indonesia, and uh, Brunei would have very similar cultural heritage. And in some cases, we even have the uh, same languages. So we share the same words. I was surprised that here in Indonesia, um, in the Philippines, expensive is mahal, which is the same here in Indonesia, and probably the same in Malaysia also. And mura is uh, cheap or inexpensive, and it's, we, see, we use the same word. So I, when I was first learning about uh, Bahasa, I was like, whoa, okay. It seems easy to learn. Okay. Uh, and finally, we have the ease of travel. Because we are part of the ASEAN countries, so we are enjoying ease of travel uh, here with us, anywhere within the Southeast Asian region. And we have a prevalence of uh, low cost airfare, which makes it easy even for students to come here. Now, in terms of uh, objectives of SIA, we have actually five major objectives. The first one is to encourage interaction and collaborations between young astronomers from all Southeast Asian nations. So, this is the biggest or the main objective why we have the SIA. We want to create uh, or establish collaborations, not just on the, uh, the, the second one, we have to provide an environment for interaction, not just in astronomy, but also for the uh, social, cultural, and interpersonal level. So it's not only a professional collaboration as colleagues, but also as a collaboration or as, as friends. Then we have to conduct regular meetings and conferences and other activities so that members will have an exposure in attending and organizing international conferences. For some of you, this might this might be the very first international conference that you will be presenting. Uh, I know it's daunting; we've all been there in that situation. But uh, this is this would serve actually as your sort of like practice okay? uh, before you go to other kind uh, other bigger uh, international conferences. The fourth objective of SIA is to encourage future gener uh, generations to uh, establish a career or to, to take up a career in astronomy. So this means uh, we need to promote astronomy in our own individual countries to the younger generation, so elementary, high school, or even to our um, young college students. Because we want to have a sustainable astronomy uh, program here in Southeast Asia. And then the final goal is to promote interaction between young astronomers in Southeast Asia and other young astronomers worldwide. So this regional collaboration that we, we are doing right now can serve also as a thank you. Okay. So the regional collaboration that we're doing right now can serve as a network or a hub when we are going to collaborate also with other areas such as South Asia, East Asia, even Europe, or even. Uh, the Americas. Okay, so in terms of the structure of SIAC, we have actually a board, a governing board for SIAC, which is composed of the chairman, that's uh, my, uh, myself, and we have also the national point of contact for each Southeast Asian country, and also and two ex officio members from SIAC. Okay. Uh, the NPAC is responsible for communicating announcements from the board to this, uh, from the board to SIAC members in their own individual countries coordinating activities and updating member information. So what happens here is that SIAC serves as a, or works under the guidance of senior astronomers in SIAC, or the Southeast Asian Young Astronomers. Uh, young, uh, sorry, Southeast Asian Astronomy Network. So there's a, an agreement between SIAC and SIAC that they will support each other in the different activities 
uh, that are uh, being conducted by the two organizations. So in terms of the organization, so the chair, I'm the chair of the CM, then we have the National Point of Contact for, uh, well, not, we don't have a National Point of Contact yet for all Southeast Asian countries, but the major Southeast Asian countries who are involved in astronomy, we have, uh, we have them. For Thailand, it's Siramas uh, Tungamita, who unfortunately can't be here. Uh, for Indonesia, it's Rorong Riyatikanto, who also is not here, although I met him yesterday. Okay. Uh, for Indonesia, it's Erika Paluesa. For Malaysia, it's uh, Norhas Lisa Yusuf, who is a, he, uh, she's here, <laughs> uh, she's Anthony. And for Vietnam, it's Pang Tuan An. And then the next official members is uh, Dr. Hakim Alasan, who you heard speak earlier, and the chair of CLAN, who is uh, Professor Bunok Sarsman Tuan Tau. Now we have also a criteria for this membership of SIAC. SIAC is open to all undergraduates and graduate students of astronomy or related fields, as well as postdocs coming from or currently working in any Southeast Asian country who are involved uh, in conducting astronomy research and in, uh, astronomy research in, uh, sorry, research in astronomy and or astrophysics. We also have individuals who are involved in astronomy education who possesses a degree or have conducted astronomy research in the past, uh, they are also eligible for memberships. So we want to maintain CIAP to be a professional society with, uh, with a good history of scientific research. Uh, also, we have a limit in terms of the age. Uh, the, well, the maximum age limit is 35, and uh, I think the original charter members of CIAP will be soon reaching this age, so in, we need to pass on the torch now to the uh, younger generation. Okay. So in terms of the history, how did SIA evolve over the years? Well, the first idea of forming a network in Southeast Asia for young astronomers started in the International School for Young Astronomers in 2007, which was held in Langhawi, Malaysia. So there were initial talks on how it was, or oh, it's like what we need to do, or the, the need, or the necessity for establishing a collaboration within the region. Uh, we had the very first informal meeting of CIA to discuss its formation on during the eight, uh, 11th April, or the Asia Pacific Regional IAU meeting, which was held in August 2008 in, uh, in Kunming, in China. And, well, literally, CIA was formed over a round of beer. Everyone was just drinking, having fun, and starting to work on the discussion. Um, maybe we should need to, uh, we need to have a collaboration or some sort of organization that would bond together the different young astronomers in the region. So you can see this picture here. Uh, well, that's me. That's Ira. He's here. <laughs> okay. Uh, and then this is Hanin, okay, also from Indonesia. So after the meeting in Kunming in uh, or after the April meeting, uh, the participants remained in constant communication through the internet. We, did, we made a mailing list, which we thought initially as the Young Sian. Okay, so it's the junior version of the Sian, which was established a few years earlier. So we keep or we kept in touch uh, through emails or through the mailing list. And then in December 2008, uh, there was the Gunma, sorry. There was the graduate Gua Super Blue Winter School, which was held in, to, uh, in Mitaka in Japan, the National Astronomical Observatory of Japan. Uh, there were several participants coming from Southeast Asia. And then that's when we decided that maybe we could uh, formalize now the creation. After the months of discussion about the Young CN, or in the Young CN mailing list, we decided to create the name, the objectives, and the goals and the future plans of the organization. So uh, after the Subaru Winter School, we went to Gunma Astronomical Observatory, who has a very members, one from the Philippines, uh, three from Indonesia, and two from Malaysia. Uh, it was not important who represented which country, but instead we focused on the question, what will and can the young astronomers do for themselves and for the progress of astronomy in the Southeast Asian region? So this is the question that Sia wants to answer. What can we do 
as young as the future generation of astronomers in Southeast Asia. What can we do to help in developing the field of astronomy? Then we had the CN all had its meeting in Manila in 2010. So this was after the creation of CIAP, we tried to develop a charter. Okay, so we drafted the original, uh, the original proponents of CIAP, drafted the charter once before the meeting, uh, the meeting. However, because of extenuating circumstances, the charter was not ratified at this time. And after the meeting, the original proponents consulted with the members of CIAP and decided to make some uh, modifications in the charter. And finally, we have in the well, the Asia Pacific Regional IAU meeting in 2011, which was held in Chiang Mai in Thailand, we were given the opportunity to have a luncheon. Okay, so it was a, uh, here we presented what is CIA, what CIA is, and also the charter, uh, charter of CIA, and it was finally ratified in July 2011. So we have a working charter which just outlines the membership, the organizational structure, the objectives of CIA. And the uh, participants got from during this meeting, well, there were nine from Thailand, five from Indonesia, three from Malaysia, and three from Philippines. Okay. Okay. So after the charter it was ratified, we created a lot of social media uh, venues where we can keep in touch, and the most popular is the the Facebook page. Who among you is a member of the Facebook page? Please raise your hand. Okay, so almost everyone is a member of the Facebook page. Okay? Uh, so this is accessible uh, to anyone actually, who, even those who are not coming from Southeast Asia. And at the moment we have around 311 members of the Facebook page. So this is where we usually post announcements regarding meetings or keeping, you know, just keeping in touch with the other uh, members of SIA. Okay? Uh, however, the 311 members, not all of them are coming from Southeast Asia. We also have a mailing list, okay? uh, CIAP group mailing list. Uh, however, I think even us in the CIAP board are not using the mailing list. We may use the Facebook page. I think the mailing list has something like 10 members only. Okay? But most of the announcements that we have right now is in uh, Facebook and Twitter. We also have Twitter, right, Adiba? Yes, we have Twitter. We have Twitter also. So if you are tweeting, uh, hashtag CIAP 2013. Yeah. Okay, then we have the discussion to make the first, uh, or to hold the first Southeast Asian Young astronomers, uh, see, uh, young astronomers meeting or the first CIAP meeting. Uh, when we were talking about where the venue would be, I was outvoted because I voted for Indonesia and everyone else for Philippines. Okay. So uh, we had it in uh, last year, almost at the same time, November 5 to 7, 2012, in Puerto Princess, Amalama, in the Philippines. So we had about 25 participants last year. So this was uh, the group last year. Uh, I think some of them are also here, the uh, second timers, are, are regulars in the CIA meeting. Okay? So we have participants from Philippines, Indonesia, Thailand, and uh, Vietnam. And we had some tours. Uh, I think the tour last year was in the underground river of Palawan, which is a, well, one of the new seven wonders of, uh, seven wonders of nature. Okay, so now we have, well, in terms of future activities, well, it's no longer future because it's present, the first one's present activity. We have the first CIA meeting, uh, oh, sorry, second CIA meeting, which is what we're having now. Uh, we're also trying to develop a database of young astronomers. That's why we collect the information in the registration to keep in touch about how long the progress of the different individuals. We plan to have in the future our astronomy outreach activities. However, what in, what, in the way that we're doing this is that we don't dictate what kind of activity that each individual country or each member would like to do. They just need to inform us that they are doing this kind of activity and we can share or we can uh, announce that kind of information. We are also uh, planning to increase the website, uh, the online presence of CIA and CIA. Uh, we have a website, www.cia.org. I think most of you are registered through that website and uh, 
uh, although we haven't done it yet, where CN also wants us to make a website, but well, we'll see what we can do. Uh, collaborations of young, with young, other young astronomers worldwide. Uh, participation in CN and IAU activities. So this is to give more uh, presence for young astronomers in the international astronomical community. Okay? And well, looking at the different uh, areas of development, which is a long-term plan. Okay, now finally, uh, I would like to close the talk with just some of the future challenges that uh, we are facing. We are trying to reach out to other Southeast Asian countries like Cambodia, Laos, uh, what else? Myanmar and Brunei. So if you know anyone who is working in astronomy research or astronomy education in these countries, please let us know so that we can uh, contact them. Uh, we want to encourage also future generations of young astronomers so that they can get, we can get more students into the field of astronomy. And we have, well, trying to obtain a lot of uh, funding support in terms of uh, in conducting the different meetings and activities from IAU, from NARI, from CN. And finally, which is essentially what's the main goal of CN, is to sustain astronomy research in the region. Because eventually, the young, these young astronomers, the members of CN, will eventually move upward into the uh, Southeast Asian Astronomy Network. Okay? So I hope that this brief talk gave you a brief an overview on what CIAC is, what are the goals of CIAC, and I hope that in the next few days we can have a very fruitful and productive meeting. And not just uh, learn, well, we can learn a lot from each other, but uh, in terms of astronomy research, but we also have to learn about each other in, in terms of a personal level. So it's not both a professional and a personal collaboration. Hey, uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, once again, good morning. It's uh, the second time for me to appear here. And yes, from now on, uh, Ira and Rafael, please sit because you're going to have 45 minutes. I hope it's not a boring session for all of you. Uh, yes, I have, I have two missions here to deliver the first invited uh, speech here, and the second is to make a nice greeting so because of, you look so formal on the first day. <laughs> it's usual. So, First, welcome to Asia, to Pamela and Pedro, because you are from the other continent. And welcome to Southeast Asia, to Irina, because you are from South Asia. And welcome to Indonesia for all of you. So, it's, I'm glad to be here, because I'm the oldest here. You can come with me. <laughs> Except maybe my colleague here, uh, Edward Diamond. And let me introduce you to him. So, let me start by giving you uh, a talk about the study of eclipsing binaries and appeal for closer collaboration in stellar astrophysics. So, I'd like to thank Edward Bannon. For those of you who are not familiar with him, this is a picture of Ed Bannon. This him. This is the binary here. He's so proud of this picture and he said, he said that he showed this picture to the younger colleagues. So, he's a, a constant partner of me in every IAU. Uh, either in commission for T2 binary system as well as the International School for Young Astronomy. So most of you who experience in attending the International School may know him very well. So he said about a word for you, which is uh, how are you? Okay, let's go to the serious one. 
So I shall start with the different types of binary system, and this uh, figure shows you some of the vital statistics numbered here. So most of us believe there is a good reason to believe that about 50 to 70 percent of all stars are binary and multiple star systems, and not only. Uh, uh, yes, uh, a small number, say 0.1 percent to 0.2 percent of all stars are eclipsing binaries. But remember, you are starting from a very big number of stars. Yet, we have about 100 million stars in the galaxy are eclipsing binaries, and 10,000 eclipsing binaries identified so far. But then we have only 200 that well studied and have reliable properties. So let's look at the range of the orbital period. The eclipsing binaries comes from a very short, ultra short period, like the uh, AM contents binaries. The, the, the shortest period, the orbital period, is only 80 minutes. So, believe it or not, there are two spherical planetary balls or, or spherical shape moving around on its own gravity with only 80 minutes period. And look at the GP cone, 46 minutes. But then we have epsilon origin, 27 or 2 years. So these two needs a different strategy in how to observe and to do research on these two kind of very extreme uh, separated objects. And look at the range of the orbital size. The, the, the orbital size can be as close as 0.1 solar radius, which is very close, up to 20 astronomical units. So recently, IAU has uh, declared a new uh, writing of AU, which is small a and small u, not the, a, not the capital A and u, since u is not. And the range of the star types, all types of stars in the binary can be found. I put a double quote here, quote here because they range from black holes, neutron stars, white holes, many star stars, giant, supergiant, round orbit, and even planets. Because the technique, the methodology that develop for binary for studying binary is now being used or employed fully to, to detect the extrasolar planet in the other star system. So next. How do you solve the problem of binary stars? So binary stars are very classical objects that used to be studied by astronomers from time to time. I recall maybe since the 18th centuries, when ALCO was found, it has been studied. And then the methodology, the technique of observation has been developed. From the light curve, using the light curve simulation or using the light curve synthesis method, we'll be able to derive many physical parameters, such as the, the fractional radii, component are A in terms of the separation, or the, the, the ratio of the effective temperature from the depth of the, of the light curve. And this comes from the L B over L A, the, 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 the ratio of the luminosity. From the shape of the light curve, we will be able to derive the period, the inclination, and if there is an eccentricity, we should be able also to derive the eccentric, eccentricity and the the periastron, the argument of the periastron. Then, if you combine the light curve solution with the radial velocity curve, from which you should derive physical parameters in terms of the ratio of mass, if, if the, the binary appears to be globalized spectroscopic binary, but if you have only, say, a one line in the spectrum, then you are only able to derive the mass function. Look at here, from the radial velocity curve, because you basically observe the projected velocity of the star into the, the, the sky, so you are bounded so much by the eye inclination here. The inclination set as a lower limit for the, the parameters that you derive. You should be also able to derive the systemic velocity, which indicates the projected velocity of the binary itself. Remember the binary moving around, and also it has the space velocity. And then, from the radial velocity, I mean the good radial velocity, you should be able also to derive the radio, the eccentricity, and the argument of the periastronomy. So if you combine all of this, so basically you solve the basic parameters of the stars, which is very much needed by theorists to develop or confirm their theoretical model of stellar evolution. So in my age, when I was as young as you, you need a, a large computer, a large telescope, a large instrument for this because of a uh, low sensitivity of this and data. But now you should be able to do this very easily from the backyard. 
So you, you, you should be able to derive the mass, radius, and velocity, and age. This is the way, uh, provided that you have a very good model to derive all these parameters from zero scale. So from this, astronomer basically build the mass luminosity law that we use now in every astronomy course. And the analysis of the structure and evolution model, even the distance determination is proposed by studying eclipse binary. Given the very high quantum efficiency of the instrument, you should be able to detect more binaries in the extra lab. So you should be able also to, dis to, to, to use the, the, the eclipsing binary as the distant measure for cosmological force. So recently we witnessed the proliferation of the multi wavelength astronomy uh, instrument, from which you should be able also to get the UV optical spectrophotometry or intermediate band photometry by combining this. Of course, you can derive precisely the effective temperature of each component, the metallicity, and even the interstellar extinction. So these are basically <coughs> the method that have been used from the old time until now, and never change. Of course, there's some perfection in, in the method itself, but basically you are going through this process to solve the very fundamental parameters of the constituent of the universe. So this is the black, what so called uh, the, the, the stellar physics is called is the binary interacting binary zoo. As I, you can see here, I plot the various population type of binary against the orbital period, and here you have a very short period like I am unfamiliar, which is for to here. Most of the binary that accessible by small telescope are residing here. You have the detached binary, many sequence binary over here, astromatic binary. So look at the range of the orbitalferic period. We have the what's all called the very well-known astronomic binary. If you go up to the mountain to the observatory, there is a long focus telescope, which has the historical one. That telescope has been dedicated since 1920 to the astronomic binary. And the member city uses very good object, a prima donna of that observatory, because most observatories constantly observe this astronomic binary from generation to generation. So, this plot shows you the various type of binary in the universe that has been uh, identified and classified by, 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 by astronomers. In the left part shows some critical or important mechanism that works on binary given the range of the orbital period. Some binary here in, the, in its evolutionary course may phase through the coalescence stage in which they merge to become a single star. And some of here remain, uh, maintain their separate structure. And some of this, think about symbiotic star, a very uh, peculiar system in which one star is a supergiant and the companion can be main sequence or, or dwarf. So you see many, uh, of course, uh, exotic phenomena here, such as chemical enrichment of the stellar matter, yes, uh, created by the stellar wind by symbiotic star. Okay, let's go through this zoo again. And in the first chart, I show you the binary system with non-degenerate components. Then we go to the binary system with degenerate components here. So in the, in the case of degenerate, one of the stars is very compact stars. It can be white dwarf, neutron star, or black hole. So here we have an M10 binary, a very uh, strong magnetic cataclysmic variable, and a post common error binary. E7147 chloride is a very good uh, example of this. It has been observed from space as well as the ground base. And a fashion phase has been unfolded by the observation of this uh, T471 chloride, K2 main sequence of white over here. We have X rays binary over here, uh, low mass X ray binary, high mass X ray binary, neutral star with white work, neutral star with main sequence, and all this occupied a very short. Uh, orbit, orbital period, but they are very faint. So most of these objects are mostly accessible by large telescopes, say diameter more than 1.5 meter telescope. Uh, a telescope in time serves to be an excellent instrument to observe this type of binary. But of course, you need also a space telescope to observe the X-ray phenomena comes from this type of binary. So binary should be observed in a multi method to get a very complete a clear picture about the nature of the planets. <coughs> Here you have the CHS barium star. This mostly observes spectroscopically 
given a very long period. But what astronomers are interested in is, in, is try to understand the nuclear synthesis from, by studying the very high resolution spectros, spectrum of the stars using the shell spectrum. So, finally, our prime target from small telescope up to large telescope, ground based telescope up to space telescope. But many people are interested in studying binary. And believe me, the number of binary outcome and number of astronomers in the world. So we still have a plenty of binary to study. You don't worry about that. Okay, so this our binary system we said we found contain a planetary downward component. It's very interesting to see that the method basically used in the old time has been, of course, developed and used with the highest precision <coughs> instrument to detect the planet around the stars. It's a bit, because basically we are observing the Doppler effect and the transit, the eclipse and the world. These two phenomena. So the challenge is how to develop the instrument to be able to detect this with the highest precision and the highest sigma to noise ratio as possible. And of course the best method to analyze this. So we have single spectroscopic binary star planet system 110. As we know, the hot Jupiter system here, with which occupy this, these all periods are within the reach of one generation. So if you dedicate yourself to study one hot Jupiter system, so until you reach the age of me, you still study this. Don't worry about that. Okay? There's no uh, an ending in researching this kind of uh, object in your life. Keep it in mind that Kepler and Apollo has a very ambitious mission by the United States to, to detect more than 400 eclipses in binaries with planets. So to get it, to, 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 yes, this is an artist's picture of the various binary stars. Some of them contain a compact object, some of them contain a magnetic phenomena, some of them, of course, have this accretion disk, which is very common in the binary system. And this is the classical artway per se. The Algol binary with the, with, with the disk here and the stellar, the stellar uh, yes, the gas here. And this all result from the mass transfer from the primary component to the secondary component due to the overflow of the Rochefort around the binary stars. Some of them has a very, uh, say, uh, well, tremendous mass transfer, and some of them go in a very slow pace like this, but yet. This gives a very effective one from the Earth to observe carefully these, these stars. Okay, so these are some examples of binaries as astrophysical tools. Binary is a primary astrophysical laboratory uh, objects. First, of course, if you monitor properties of the star, this is very much needed by theories. All the theories require us or may direct us to build a new strategy observe the star to confirm the theory. So you should be able to derive the mass, absolute value, density, and gravity acceleration, while the, the effective temperature coming from the spectral colors and spectral photonic. And remember, this is a very fundamental formula that has been used by astrophysicists, Stefan Wolf and Lowe, in which from the luminosity you should be able to get the volumetric correction and from the volumetric correction be also able to fit all your model actually the observer. And then you have the IMRT effective for luminosity over the luminosity of the sun to build this mass luminosity relation, mass age relation, luminosity temperature effective relation, and so on. So these tools are very much needed to study the stars in terms of the evolution and the structure itself. So in all time, we are still studying in deriving the Helium abundance, which, of course, the model needs a very good mechanistically estimation or C estimation. But nowadays, also, people try to observe the Helium in the primary of Helium, in the beginning of the early stage of the universe, by studying the, the Helium abundance from the very, very suspected old stars using a very sensitive instrument. And the problem of contact with the core of, of the shooting it's still, of course, available until now. What is the best alpha opportunity here and the use? There are many foundations of the evolution both incorporated of the core of the shooting of stellar but they create this mostly as the free parameter, as well as the common flow and effective efficiency parameter. 
So the experiment is using a modern protocol approach to identify population synthesis. But still, we need a fairly good theory that even can be, can be understood by other measures. And the evolutionary age, of course. Remember the dispute about the evolutionary age of the universe, the how and has the cost of all. But uh, we still have a problem until now. Okay, next is uh, atmospheric eclipses and solar eclipse months. This figure shows you how the time start like epsilon over IJ, okay, uh, coupled with the uh, very complex stars down this. So basically, what you see here is the giant star is not steady here, but it's of course moving around the center of mass. Given the mass of this star, the size doesn't mean that the mass is big. But if you have one big star, uh, one small star, if you compare the mass, you see this star uh, wobble. You should be able to spectroscopically detect the wobble of this star because this star is very faint. So you are only able from the ground exposure to these stars. So what kind of instrument you should be able to detect? It's very uh, slow, very small. And the gravity of the city. So, probably the atmosphere of the cool star is one of the mainstream here, in which uh, this object, a long period of heat, has returned a small part of the planet's surface. These are some of the objects that can be observed. And remember, these stars are bright, accessible by 10 centimeters. So, you have PD sapphire binaries, which consists of M, J, and Hot Companion, a short period. The power IJ system here and also oxygen so this like oxygen analysis. And this is the family example the P471 horizon consists of EK2, uh, dwarf density stars with the white rock, and here is only half this. And some of the stars share the similarity with this P471 horizon at the combined EU database and letters. Recently, astronomers in the United States, they did a very good technique on what's so called tomography. So they try to make a face coverage of a very high spectroscopic observation covering uh, the face lock. And they try to reconstruct three dimensionally the picture of the binary that's study there. In this case, you need a high resolution spectrograph, you need a very efficient detector in which you can. Uh, make the time resolved observation, yet you have very high signal noise. This two cannot be compromised easily. If you shorten your exposure time, you need to lower the signal noise. But you have to, 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 to time to recover time in the very short. So the challenge is how to build the instrument, the very effective instrument, to observe both. So this is the technique. So, uh, this is the third holics. That's actually negative as well, this star, and then we point this to the optical RS-100 star to, to make a map surface of the star spot and map to it. There will be one RS-100 uh, presentation today, and X-ray from coronal maps of the cool star and two graphic studies of the patient process. This object, this study is very interesting because first, you are trying to observe a, a, a time of a phase, and second, you need to build a very good computer code for to solve this, to map this. The tomography has been used mostly by medical doctors, but not used by astronomers to map the stars. And we have advantage because we are remaining stable. We, we, we remain silent to Earth or we remain quiet to Earth, but the stars are not. In the medical imaging, of course, the instrument moves around the, the body of the patient. Now the body of the star moves, so we have to basically get a three dimensional picture of the star if you are able to, of course, analyze a deeper of the star by using an appropriate model and computer coding. Okay, analyze of epic timing is a very active field and was also uh, uh, and I was uh, engaged in this activity. So there are many uh, physical studies that. Uh, of course, can be conducted based on the analysis of active standing. The active standing itself observation is very simple. We try to construct the O minus C diagram based time. And you learn the behavior from this. So from learning the behavior from this, you incorporate various physical mechanisms such as orbit 
when you change your muscle, I change your muscles, most classical one. Or if you are able to disentangle this woman C, you should be able also to study the long term outsider motion studies of eccentric families. And from the outsider motion, you should be able also to determine the infinite structure in which you derive the, the, the distribution of the density of the stars. Or you should be also able to, to study the outsider motion of, in, in terms of uh, general relativity. Remember the full sum of the air that we studied heavily using this outsider motion of general relativity effects. Or a classical light time that we have to to detect the third body, the presence of the third body that is the actual stability of the binary system itself. So the fundamental expression, if we have a multiple system, what is the base hierarchy? It's most stable hierarchy. Should be this a transition line one or any equal situation? This is a very good example of P471 or P471 or This is the O minus C that shows the stable third body. Of course, this light and effect tells us the presence of the third body. And moreover, from this, we should be able to the third body without having to see this. You don't have to see this third body, but the, the effect of this third body in the binary system can be studied. So, in 1989, I studied this for the LP5 system, the triple system in the binary, in the, in the planet. It's very interesting to find out that even the central star of planetary nebula can consist of more than one star. The current understanding of planetary nebula, planetary nebula is to evolve the last stage of the single star into with an intermediate mass. But only a small number of binary of planetary nebula consists of those binary. So we should, of course, have a more general theory of planetary nebula by observing its central star. So the detection of third bodies in the light and the effect. And this technique, if they go properly, can be used to detect the substellar size components. I'm not talking about the gravitational lens, but there is a presentation about micro lensing. This is somewhat related to micro lensing. In the case of micro lensing, of course, we observe it. But here, we try to, to provide them with the related substellar size components. Which can be followed up by the reputation lens uh, practice. So, P471 online download system uh, published by Vivas in 2003 is the best example of the lifetime lifetime effect study in closed binary system. So, existing binary star planet system, not so much, only eight candidates are now known, about 100 expected in the near future. And these are listed here. Most of them come from the Google. It's a provisioned gravitation lens survey and has been observed uh, optically. And it's a very nice transit curve that has been detected. Look at this. We have only uh, from 1 here to 0 0.985. And this is so far the largest attribute that can be transit that can be, that can be observed. Mostly they are only 1% or 1%. We should have a very good technique, the different good definition of automatic and observing inside. To be able to detect this. So this is the phase pattern for all four, which is the observed classic. Not surprising because it's observed from space. But look at this note here. The Kepler or Korak mission will get 100 or more. And Kepler with its leading attitude of automatic position. And Kepler for detecting the early science standards. Quite ambitious one. But all of this is there, and the temperature is also there. The better is strength. So, you need the cutting edge capability with a high precision spectroscopy to, to, to follow up the detection by the and, and, and temper with the highest compromise. And you should be able to develop the code to study the atmosphere, the orbit of the planet with a high precision spectroscopy, which is within the reach of Southeast Asia astronomer mostly, with a high precision spectroscopy. And detection of large moons on the planet. Okay, this is a very good picture from the uh, uh, HST. We are able to detect the additional sodium absorption due to light passing through the planetary atmosphere. So we are even able to detect the atmosphere present in the extra planet by looking at the high resolution spectra.
especially it's looking like about 5,400 years from the sunrise targets. And they use the prospect of the objectives and the, during the transit and the out of transit phase. Uh, Is of course a very object for us who mostly stay in Southeast Asia near the tropic. We have monsoon, we have somewhat uh, yes, a short observing window after heavy rain. So think about making a telescope that resists against this high humidity. But then there are the object still accessible. Both our components are non-contact, neither components is generate star, the spectral type should be A and B. So this detached binary system can be observed, and of course we can produce a very nice type of radio telescopy. So given a good tools, we should be able also to, to solve the problem of this binary star. So the aim is it's very easy to accurate physical quantities of the components, to study period change in the binary system, and to clarify the evolutionary status. Then there are some physical parameters that can be observed, but mostly what you can observe from the, the number of objects here, including the mass ratio, the mass of the primary and secondary, if you have a good radial velocity curve, or the radius. These two are very important for and look at this period here, 0 0.4 days, 0 0.4 days, 0 0.5 days, a few hours, or a few days here, or 1.45 days. So I'd like to recall my old work. It was in 1989. So most of you maybe are not born. Because, uh, yes. So I did this using a very old telescope, 37 centimeter refractor, with a simple DC DVD. And mostly I did it alone. So you can imagine I have to go here to push the, the, the hour angle the telescope and after the telescope is pointed to the star, I have to always check the tracking of the telescope from time to time because the tracking is not perfect because this is a very long telescope, 7, seven meter telescope. This is a refractor and I did it for UV because of course it's impossible to do U photography with a refractor because the light will be absorbed by the, by the glass. Well, I did it in 1984 but then it is published in the Astronomical Journal. So these are the light curve. Despite of the scatter, we, we, able, we were able to fit the nice uh, light curve synthesis here. And even solve this problem and derive the system parameters here. It has been published uh, about 25 years ago. And of course, I follow up this observation. Why? Because recently we built this new most compact spectrograph in the year 2000, collaborating with Japanese colleague. So we built this, and if you look at here, uh, well, you are planning to visit the observatory, you can see there, this is the old spectrograph that we had in 1989, and we built the 2000, uh, in 2000, a new spectrograph with the CCD here, and this is the new spectrograph that we have, the spectrograph we brought it. And this is the photo photometer that we use, I used in 1984, and now we have the 1989 photon hunter Hanwatsu photometer. And this is the oldest CCD camera, very big one. It is as, uh, yes, as heavy as 15 kilograms, but now we have only, well, two, two, one and a half kilogram CCD camera attached to our telescopes here. So the evolution of astronomical data acquisition at small observatory uh, serves as a very good, uh, of course, uh, tools for us to develop our ability to observe. And look at this one telescope. The Casablanian refractory photo donated by Japanese government in the year 1989 up to 1990s. And within Southeast Asia, we have Pi, the telescope in Asia, 
and the Philippines. And Sri Lanka also have that. Okay, so we are in a very good position actually to observe something together. Because given the, the similar telescope, there are many good programs that can be set up using this. And we are distributed longitudinally and latitudinally. So it should be very easy to conduct this in the future. So this is a very nice D45, uh, D45 centimeter with 12 channel mounting and a CCD and every kind of instrument can be equipped here. So we have also a remote telescope system, a lot smaller one. This telescope has been used mostly by my students for formatting observation, in which you are going to listen to their presentation. Yes, and yes, this spectrograph. Somebody must share this. We mean reminding my time, it's okay. It's okay. Yeah. And this other spectrograph that I like to show you here. A new observation of this. And this other radio velocity that has been observed using this spectrograph. Very nice uh, radial velocity curve constructed by him, uh, by Irfan in 2005. He observed the, the ES Libra eclipsing binary. And as you can see here, these are some lines that can be detected by using the spectrograph, the H alpha line, the H alpha, H beta line here. This is a telluric line, but here you can see the consortium line. And he used this to construct this radial velocity curve. And from this, he solved the binary structure and some parameters. Fortunately, unfortunately, this binary has no light work yet. The ESD but still Libra is an accessible stars from the Southeast Asia region. It should be able to do photometric this. Or this is a very nice combination of photometric and spectroscopic observation conducted at Moscow Observatory using the 45 centimeter telescope. Here you can see the light curve, and along the light curve here, there is a spectra low dispersion spectra, low dispersion spectra obtained from this star. As you can see, the spectral energy distribution change as a function of the phase here. Remember, if you are having this primary meaning, you have this, uh, of course, fainter star or lower temperature star in front of the more the hotter star. And on the other hand, you have the hotter star eclipsing the cooler star. Then basically, in, at this moment, if this is a total eclipse, you can see the primary and secondary component. Mostly spectral coverage of this. So this phase, lock, phase coverage uh, spectra is important for us to study actually the model of this binary system. And this is the O minus C. You should, you should be able to listen to this more in IRA presentation about the project. And interesting eclipsing binary is still Right, but yet unstudied, good for small telescope or CCD. And most of you have this actually at your telescope. So, for those of you, what is needed to observe the eclipsing binary? Not so much. You need only a refracting telescope with a 20 meter, more than 20 centimeter, and DVIR filter with the vessel prescription, a spectrograph, a CCD camera, and most important, observer. For most uh, Asian countries, you have telescopy, but you have no observer mostly. Because the observers sleep also at night. <laughs> Try to stay awake and observe. Yes. So you do relative spectroscopy and differential photometry rather than spectrophotometry and absolute photometry because the climate in Southeast Asia is not as good as Hawaii, as Chile, the other place. Yes. And this can be participated by most countries within Asia. Okay, so I'll give me a sign. So to conclude, binary and multiple star system are most common population stars. Single star appear to be much more rare. To understand these stars and galaxy, it is imperative to study binary and multiple stars. So currently we are likely for over 15,000 eclipses in binary, but with upcoming Einstein might field survey like LSST. More than one million to be available for analysis and interpretation within 10 years. There are many things to do. We need to develop protocols to harvesting these features. And interferometry, I will not touch upon this because it's a very difficult technique. But look at this high precision photometry can be achieved in the, in the uh, underprivileged situation given a very good technique of observation that we develop. High precision, high signal to noise spectroscopy might be the large telescope. 
And I think Telescope of Navi can serve as a very good uh, instrument to be used by most of you in the future to, to, to study new things. And remember, there are space and new ground-based facilities from X-ray. A new world of binary can be emerged here, in which you need only a powerful supercomputer, computer for theoretical models and analysis. Uh, I think Lisa is going to touch upon this. And availability to access the huge is most important for you, young astronomers. The International Virtual Observatory provided with a number of data. So access to everyone, even with the PC and internet. And the brave new world of binary studies is today. Availability and easy access to ground-based data and space-based astronomical observatory and data. So I'd like to show you, this is a small sample of LMC Eclipsing binary in the older database. Look at this carefully. How many light groups there? Okay. So, even one room cannot solve all this light group. Too many light groups here. This is only 100,000 light groups that you observe. These are observed for you and waiting to analyze it for you. Okay, okay. Uh, at the end, Smalls can be linked to the yield grid result, provided a similar level of technical <coughs> characteristic, optimal network, and choice of research program. So we'll leave it to you. And thank you very much. Thank you, thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Martin, for your very informative lecture. Uh, we have time for a few questions. If anyone would, want, uh, ask, would like to ask questions, this is your chance to uh, have a you go back to the slide where you show the nice transit. Oh yes, the nice transit here. Yes, yes, the back. Here you, you mentioned that uh, from the transit you can uh, identify the property of the absorption by the atmosphere, right? So my question is that uh, how can you distinguish between the absorption from the atmosphere and the, the obstacles of the star? Uh, that's a good question. Uh, yeah. What basically people do is to, to develop the atmospheric structure and do a spectral synthetic from the planet and the stars. And remember the nature of the, the look at this, for example, the sodium line. Okay? From a very careful analysis of the depth, the absorption line, you should be able to identify which are components from the normal atmosphere of the star, and there is some additional absorption due to the planet atmosphere. So people usually try to detect this at the very transit phase like this, and then they detect this. So from an analysis of the depth of this, because this component comes from additional. And remember the rotation of the I give the Doppler effect. So by looking at the split of this two natrium doublet and look at the depth of this, the people are able to detect the planetary atmosphere from the sodium line. So you need a good atmospheric model of the planet and the star itself. But the planet consists of the reflected black body from the stars plus the atmosphere emitted by that planet. So it's very interesting. But there's a very good report, a good publication on this. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, other questions? Yes. Thank you for, for the very nice review. My, my question is about, yes. of course, exoplanets yes. and around binary stars. Well, what, is there a number for what's the percentage? of binary stars with exoplanets? Uh, yes, as I showed you in the vital statistic here, uh, actually here, nah, this one, yeah, as you can see here, not so much compared to the whole binary here, about 100 that yet going to be, of course, published in the near future, uh, only, only eight candidates can be detected, yes. But there's still a very good uh, result from the gravitational lensing survey, which I'm not incorporated in here. So 
So I'm, I'm not really sure what the exact number of this, but eight means that it, eight has a very good candidate potential for this object. Thank you. Other questions? Yes, the other thing there is we have a mini magnitude actually, mini magnitude capability to, to, yeah, to detect this. And not all large telescope time allocation is given for this, unfortunately. So it must be conducted by a dedicated telescope. Any other questions? So if there are uh, young astronomers who are interested in collaborating with uh, Dr. Manasan, you can uh, let him know. Okay, uh, let's thank Dr. Manasan again for his very important Okay, uh, our next part, the next part of the program actually is we are, we're going to have a coffee, 15 minute coffee break. Okay, so everyone would, has to be back here by 10 o'clock. Okay, uh, reminder for though, uh, we have some program changes. Okay, so we have a different